Christianity is, of course, one of the world's many religions, but religion is, is really not a word that the New Testament uses of, of Christianity. Um, other religions emphasize what man must do uh, to be good, to be righteous, to, to get to heaven. Whereas the Christian faith, of course, emphasizes what, what God has, has done in reconciling us to himself through, through Christ. So where religion says do, God says, God says done. Where religion says work, uh, Christianity says, says rest in, in Christ. And yet as Christians, we are called to do and to, and to work. Not to earn our salvation, but because we, because we are. And so knowing God, having a relationship with God, being reconciled to God means a changed life. And a response to what God has, has done, the Christian delights to do what God's word says. Today's key exhortation, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Stand with me and we'll read verses 19 to, to the end of the chapter. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is, to, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Father, as we come to your word this morning, Lord, as the book of Hebrews says, your word is powerful. It's, it's, it's sharp. It's able to, able to divide. And we pray this morning as we consider the importance of being hearers and doers. God, if there's any hearing but not doing in our lives, Lord, that by your spirit you draw that to our attention, that we could be a people that are sanctified, set apart, and useful to you in your, in your kingdom. Father, have your way in each heart and each life. Lord, may the word implanted uh, deep in our hearts this morning find good soil and produce much fruit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a, please take a seat. By way of context, background to where we've just been, James has been talking about trials and temptations. And he's just described, if you remember from last week, what God is like and what he has done. What is God like? We, we saw that God cannot be tempted. He, he gives good gifts. God is good. He's the father of lights and he is, he is unchanging. What has God done? Look back to verse, verse 18 very quickly. Of his own will, we read, he brought us forth by the word of God of truth. He saved us and he did it through the, through the gospel. But having saved us, what does God now purpose? That we might be a kind of first fruits of his, of his creatures. We talked briefly last week about how the first fruits were, were holy and so God's desire for your life is that you would be holy, that you would be sanctified, that you would become more like Christ. And really the rest of the chapter and on into the, on into the, the rest of the book, we see what this looks like in, in practice. Our key verse today is verse 22, but be doers of the word and, and not hear is only deceiving yourselves. And I think it's worth noting up front that, that, that doing does not just mean doing good works, uh, doing external acts. I think when we hear the word doers or doing, we can tend to think of the things that we, the things that we do, good works and the, and the likes. It does include this. And we're going to see that later on in terms of caring for orphans and, and, and widows. 
But doing is about doing everything that the Word of God says as the Word of God touches upon all areas of our, of our lives. So this morning as we consider being doers of the Word, we're going to look at, first of all, being doers personal holiness, verses 19 through 25, and then also the, the practical help side, verses 26 and 27, that it's not one or the other, but it's both. And actually in this chapter, the greater emphasis is on the sanctification, the personal holiness holiness side James starts off and, and he calls my uh, my beloved brethren so then my beloved brethren and we should be reminded that he loves he he cares for um, he desires the good of the audience that he writes to but then he has a crisp threefold instruction for them let every man be swift to hear your translation may say uh, quick to listen. The word swift or quick is uh, tachys, as in uh, a, a tachometer, uh, which measures, measures rotation speed. Now James has just spoken regarding the word of, of truth, and it's important that we be swift to hear God's, God's word, that we be quick to listen to God's word, both in your personal, private, devotional time, when you open your Bible each day, and absolutely on a Sunday morning when the Word of God is taught that you be quick to listen, you be eager to listen to God's Word. But I wonder, does this describe you with, with others? Are you quick to listen? Are you all ears and engaged when others, when others speak? Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. It, of course, doesn't say slow of speech, but it says uh, slow to speak, right? Don't be hasty with your, with your words. And I think too often we have, it, we have it around the other way, don't we? So often we're swift to speak and we're slow to listen. We're slow to listen and swift to, to speak. Are you considered in your words? Or do you speak the, the first thing that comes to mind and, and think later? It's interesting when you think about the, the, the human body and the way that God has placed the different, different, different parts, right? You think of your ears, right? You've got two of them, of course, and they're outward. They're, they're open, right? They're, they're there. They're ready to, to hear. And you think of the mouth, the way God has made it, sort of hemmed in with teeth and then lips as well, right? It's like he's put a double protection against, uh, against the tongue. And of course, we've been given two ears and one mouth, and wisdom says we should use them in that, uh, in that proportion. He then says, slow to, to wrath, slow to, to anger. Last week, when it came to temptation, we spoke of, of the human tendency to, to blame others at times. And I think when it comes to anger, this is another thing where people can find their excuses for their short temper, their anger that overflows at times right it's my my Irish ancestry the the red hair uh, I've got a migraine a sore back uh, it's just the way that I am I'm just an angry person that's the way that God God made me but being quick to anger um, easily becoming irate going off at people losing your rag these are things that are not befitting of a, a Christian the Christian is to be swift to hear slow to speak slow to become angry. We read in verse 20, for the wrath of God of man does not produce the righteousness of God. God desires that his, that his righteousness be found in you and, and anger does not produce it. It's worth noting that there is of course a connection between the, connection between the three. If you're someone who does not listen to others and you are quick to speak, then there is that much more likelihood that, that you will become angry quicker because you're not listening to the, to the person. You find yourself in more disputes and arguments with, with people. Whereas the opposite is, is also true. If you are someone who is, who is quick to listen, to really listen, understand what a person is saying, where they're coming from, you're slow and you're considered with your, with your words. You don't have foot and mouth disease when it comes to, to, to speaking then you are that much more likely not to find yourself in situations where anger overflows. Either you've made someone angry or you become angry at them, at them yourself. Now I want to be vulnerable for a moment and I'm trusting you with this. But here is a painting that I did 
uh, of this verse, probably in my early teens at some point, you, you can't see it at the back, but it says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. There's a painting gene in my family. My grandmother was a wonderful painter. My mum is a very good painter. My daughter, Isley, is also a, a, a really a budding artist and uh, becoming very good at, at painting. But that gene sort of skipped, uh, skipped me. I did art painting through to seventh form, uh, year 13. And it was, my, uh, it was my chill out. It was my goof around sort of a, sort of a subject. And an issue I had when it came to painting is I actually never learned to mix paint. Or better said, I never bothered to learn to, to mix paint. And I deliberately chose, I got a kick out of this when I saw it, because I think this was done in my early teens, but in my later teens, last year of high school, I pretty much did the same thing for my final portfolio, which I deliberately chose abstract art and mountains in order to hide the fact that I couldn't paint and that, <laughs> and that I, certainly couldn't, uh, I certainly couldn't mix paint paints. Uh, my kids will at times you know, say, hey dad, what does blue and red make? And I'm, I don't know, I don't know. Purple, orange, green, I don't, I don't know. Um, painting 101, right? Mixing paints. I was an immature painter. I never, I never grew in that area. I never progressed very far. And I think when we look at the, the, this opening verse, you know, this is Christianity 101 stuff right here. How you relate to and engage with others, what you're like with your words and how you listen to other people, uh, anger in your life. This is, this is basic stuff. This is elementary. So how you are with your family, how you are with your friends in these areas, how you are in the workplace, uh, how you are at life group with other Christians, how you are at church, how you are at the mall. All of that matters, and all of that is part of your personal holiness, your sanctification journey. And so the mature Christian has self-control in these areas. And in all seriousness, a lack of self-control actually speaks of a need to mature, a need to grow up in these in these things. We go on in verse 21, therefore we read, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Something we all do every day, I hope, is lay aside and put on uh, when you get dressed. You exchange the dirty clothes of yesterday, yesteryear, for the new and the fresh clothes of, of, of today. Something that all Christians are called to do is to lay aside, as in the taking off of a garment, the deeds of the, of the old life. So James says, lay aside all filthiness, uh, moral uncleanness, moral impurity, dirtiness, sordidness, turptitude. Lay aside all overflow of wickedness. Does anybody have the King James Version here? Any King James Version is here? Your translation will say, Surplu superfluity of naughtiness. Isn't that a good translation? <laughs> Lay aside all superfluity of naughtiness. The picture there, overflow of wickedness, is really of, of a garden overflowing uncontrollably with, with weeds. Root out the weeds of sin in your life. And our passage that was, that was read uh, earlier from Colossians, Colossians 3, it says up on the screen, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him. So for the Christian, you know, sin's relating to the, to the, to the old life, to the bad old BC days before you knew Christ. Things that used to characterize you are to characterize you no, no more. And we read and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your, your souls. As you said at the beginning, salvation is not a matter of doing, but, 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 but receiving. Receiving what God has done for you through, through the gospel, through Christ's death on the, on the cross. James refers to the implanted word, the, the, the rooted word that has been sown in the soil of your, of your hearts. 
What is your attitude towards the Word of God that is able to save your souls? We're to have meekness. We're to have humility towards God's Word. And it stands to reason, doesn't it, that, that if, if you are saved through the Word, because it's through the Word that you, that you hear the Gospel, right? The Gospel is the power of God unto, unto salvation. If, if salvation has come to you through God's Word, then your attitude to, to, to the whole of God's Word should be one of, of humility, one of, of meekness, one of, of teachability. You must humbly accept it as his word, not seeking to change it or to contextualize it in a way that suits your interpretation, but, but, but rather allow the word of God to change you. Too many Christians seek to change the word and not to allow it to change them. And to be changed by God's word, you of course must be in it, right? You must have your Bible open throughout the week, reading it, studying it, absorbing it, hearing the word. Yes, you hear the word of God on a Sunday morning, but 45, 50 minutes on a Sunday is, is, is not enough for you. You need to be in the word of God yourself throughout the, throughout the week. And then we read our key verse, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. There was James along with his brothers and his mother, Mary. They'd come to speak to Jesus Things had gone far enough. They'd grown up together in the same house in Nazareth. They'd worked together alongside their father, Joseph, and all worshipped in the synagogue. But around age 30, something changed. Jesus called a group of disciples and set himself up as a, as a rabbi. He'd become a preacher and a teacher, and the, crocs flo and the crowds flocked to him. He was also healing people. James didn't know that he could do that. Anyway, things had gone far enough. Jesus had forgotten who he was. So James and the family came to have words with him. But they couldn't get through to him because of the crowd. So they sent word. Tell Jesus his mother and brothers are here. We need to talk. But he would have none of it. What was that he said? And whatever could it mean? Up on the screen, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it, Jesus said. James, uh, this is a vital instruction within this book. Um, a central pillar, a central plank of his whole thesis, his whole argument throughout, right? You've got to have a living faith. You've got to, uh, faith without works is dead. Um, you've got to be a doer and a hearer of the word. And it would seem that James learnt a, a vital lesson firsthand from, from Jesus in this regard. Jesus said, who, 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 who are my mother? Who are my brothers? It's the one who hears the word of God and does it, who obeys it. It's one thing to hear God's word, right? And, and the word hearer there, it means one who's seriously listening. It's not a cursory listen. It's a serious, it's a deep listen. They're really leaning in to listen to what's being said. And, and, and that should be you when it comes to God's word. But it's another thing altogether to, to, to hear God's word and to obey it, to do what it, what it says. Knowledge and the study, knowledge and study is good. And we should all be those who have great knowledge of, of, of Christ, of God's ways. Um, there's reading of the Bible, but there's also studying it, you know, in more depth. Seeking out issues, understanding doctrines that are not just found in one passage, but you need to look at the, the, the panorama of Scripture to understand all, all that God's Word says about this or that issue. Study and knowledge is good. But, but without application, without obedience, it's just that. It's just knowledge. And worse, James says it's self-deception. Three times in this, in this chapter, um, he's warned against deception. Verse, verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Verse 22, we've just read it, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And a little bit later on, if anyone among you thinks he is religious, verse 26, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own, deceives his own heart. 
And again, what is the deception that James is speaking of? What is described? The deception, the self-deception he describes is hearing God's word, but not doing it. You know, one of the blessings of, of teaching the scriptures the way we do at, at Calvary is, is, is that you come to know the scriptures. You come to really know the scriptures. Any given Sunday may not be a earth-shattering sermon that you hear, but week after week, your, your knowledge of God's word grows and grows. You, you grow, you grow. But I think there's a danger for us that it's possible to be well-fed, but poorly exercised. It's possible to become hearers, but not, not doers. One commentator says, too many Christians mark their Bibles, but their Bibles never mark them. We continue on again, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James takes the point of hearing the word and doing it further by use of an illustration regarding a, a mirror. Now, has anyone ever seen videos of um, an animal give itself a fright when it looks in the mirror, right? Usually it's a cat or a dog and, you know, hey, the joys of the, of the internet. You could spend your life looking at such videos um, if you were inclined to do so, which I don't encourage. But, 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 but a cat, right, it sees itself in the mirror and it jumps a mile, it hisses with its fur um, upright. The dog will bark frantically at the intruder. Um, but then five minutes later, they forget the whole thing and, and see themselves again and the whole process re repeats, right? Does anyone's pets do that? Are you caught them doing it at times? Kind of humorous <coughs> and expected um, when it comes to an animal, but actually preposterous and decidedly unfunny in a, in a human. Excuse me for a moment. Now, what is the purpose of a mirror? <laughs> it's to observe yourself, isn't it? Right? To see if you've got anything in your teeth, if there's any spots or blemishes, to see how your hair looks in the morning, right? This is sort of how my hair looks in the morning. And then the, the second point of a mirror is to see yourself, right? Observe yourself, and, and secondly, to adjust accordingly, right? To take evasive action, to remove the dinner from your hair, to perhaps apply makeup, to do your hair. So, <laughs> it is, um, it would be odd, wouldn't it? If you come to church on a Sunday morning, how's that looking? How's that looking? <laughs> it would be odd, wouldn't it, on a Sunday morning to see someone, is it more or less okay? A little bit better? <laughs> Um, to see someone come to church and they've got wild bed hair, right? Or if they've got a chicken wing from last night sort of stuck in their, stuck in their teeth, right? And they come to church and you wonder why people are, why people are staring at you. Well, interesting here, James, he doesn't say that the man forgets what he looks like. But he says he forgets what kind of man he, he was. Um, what's the purpose of a mirror? Again, the purpose of a mirror, to observe yourself and then to adjust accordingly. I'd hazard a guess everyone here this morning has looked at a mirror at some point and done a few little adjustments. The purpose of a mirror is to reveal appearance, but the purpose of God's word is to reveal what kind of a man, what kind of a woman you are, to show to you your, your character. Now, of course, when it comes to the non-Christian, right, the, the, the law, the Ten Commandments, um, it, it can't save, but it reveals the non-believers' sin to themselves, right, and shows them their need for Christ. For the Christian, we are under the law of, of liberty. Not under, not under law, but we're under grace. But the Word of God, it still shows us where change is, is needed in our, in our lives. So the Christian who hears the word but does not do it is like a man who looks in a mirror 
but takes no action. The Christian who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and that word looks there, it's the idea of stooping, of, of bending down, of, of, of really looking intently. They look into God's word with a view to seeing what they're truly like and with a willingness to, to change. It, does that describe you when it comes to, to God's word? When you open it, when you read it, God, reveal yourself to me, reveal myself to me, show me who I am, show me what I'm like, show me where I need to, to change. One commentator says, what a mirror the word of God provides. It shows a man exactly what he is with all his faults and failures and infirmities. And yet, as he gazes upon that reflection, he beholds another image, that of the ideal man, Jesus Christ. And he sees what he himself should be. Now, I think we have a, say a little microcosm of this today. Back in verse 19, we have this threefold crisp instruction, right? Be swift to hear, slow to speak slow to wrath. And, and perhaps you hear that instruction and you realize that you have maturing in one or, or all of those, or those areas. Right, we go through those verses and, and you, you're, you're convicted. You think, oh, that's, I've got to change in this area. But, but do you simply give mental assent during a, during a sermon and say, yep, that's me, right? Direct hit, pastor. Or, and then that's it. Or do you take it to the Lord? God, this is not right. Please help me. Please change me. Please grow me in this, in this area. And I think there we have the difference between one who simply hears, right? We've just done it in some of these verses. One who simply hears and one who actually does something about it. The mirror of God's word has done its work. It showed you who you are. But it's now on you to, to, to either do nothing or to do something. One is a forgetful here, the other is, uh, is wise. And then he says, verse 25, this one will be blessed in what he, he does. This is the uh, second beatitude that, that, that James has in his book. We looked at one last week. But again, this is an echo of Jesus' words. Uh, Luke 11, 27 up on screen. And it happened as he, Jesus, spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and, and keep it. So again, James is not writing something new here. He's, he's, he's speaking the words of, of Jesus. And, and perhaps you've read the Bible a hundred, a hundred times. If you have, that's wonderful. Perhaps you're the greatest theologian in the room. Perhaps you can memorize and have memorized great chunks of scripture, whole chapters, books even. All of those things are great, are awesome, should be encouraged. But it's not, an, it's not a knowledge of Christian doctrine that, that blessing is found. There is blessing in that. But the blessing, the happiness is found not simply in knowing and hearing God's word, but in doing it and keeping it. The focus so far has largely been on personal holiness, uh, issues of the heart. But here we look a little bit at practical help, verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Um, in my early 20s, I uh, traveled with a friend to uh, South America and we, we uh, did the Machu Picchu uh, Trail in uh, Peru. And we had a guide who took us on this uh, four-day, three-night uh, trek. Um, he went by the name Lobo, Wolf, which I suspect was not his uh, real name. But uh, as we were going on this journey and he was telling us about the Inca city citadel, um, over again, he, he would say to us uh, of, of Machu Picchu, he'd say, it is a religious place. It is an agricultural center. It is an economic center. And I think by religious place, he was speaking of the many temples and the priests offering sacrifices, right? Both crop and, and human. Um, and certainly there was a form of religiosity to these sun-worshipping pagans, as is 
the case with many religions in the world today. And when people think of religion, um, including when used of, of, of Christianity, they'll often be thinking of, of the external, right? Grand cathedrals with stained glass windows, um, the ceremony of, of high liturgy, um, the robes of clergy whose hair is nicely done, um, gestures even, right? Spiritual gestures that people make, the things that you, the things that you wear. And so much the emphasis is on being good and doing good. So much it's about outward, um, outward appearance over inner reality. Uh, Israel, of course, got caught up in such religiosity, both in you know, Old Testament times, but also in Jesus' day, right? All about the feasts and the fasts and the, the outward appearances, doing things to be seen, rather than the weightier issues of justice, of, of mercy, of walking humbly with, with God. As I said at the beginning, religion is really not a word that's used of, of Christianity. And actually, when it is used, it's used in a negative connotation. Uh, Paul spoke of his previous life as a, as a Pharisee, uh, where he was among the, the strictest sect of their religion, he says, Acts 26. On Mars Hill, uh, preaching at the Areopagus, Paul observed how the Athenians, uh, with their many altars, were uh, a very religious people. In Colossians 2, uh, speaking of legalism, uh, Paul there refers to the false humility and religious worship of, of angels. Well, here in James, we have the most concentrated references to, to, to religion in the New Testament. The word religious and the word religion is used twice, and it's really not positively used. He says, verse 26, if anyone, anyone among you thinks he is religious, almost as if to say, if we must use that word, um, if you're a religious type and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, he says that one's, this one's religion is, is useless. So you dress up for church, you give to charity, uh, you sing in the choir, you, you wear a cross around your, or your, around your neck. Here's where the rubber meets the, meets the road. What do you like with your words, James says? how you speak to, to others. And, and self-control here over the tongue, and also, of course, in chapter 3, where he really goes to town on this topic, it's really a litmus test of, of spirituality, of, of, of maturity, of holiness. The one who is able to bridle the tongue, they are the mature, Paul, James says at the beginning of chapter 3. I think we shouldn't dismiss the human ability to deceive one's own hearts. To, to, to think that you're one thing, even to think you're spiritual. But the reality is something else. And again, uh, such spiritual pride often is because you are knowledgeable. You know the scriptures like the back of your hand. You're the smartest person in the room. It's easy to be self-deceived and not to realize that actually you're not living it out in your life. He says that uh, such a one, so, uh, such outer religiosity without inner reality, without the fruit of a changed life is, is useless. It's, it's futile. It's worthless. And then we read verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. This is what true religion looks like, he says, to visit orphans and widows in their, in their trouble. Real religion absolutely involves practical help. And, and Bible times, of course, and, and still in much of the world today, orphans and, and, and widows are among the, the most uh, at risk, at most in need, um, oftentimes in perilous situations. And in the Old Testament, it often highlights God's heart for, for the orphan, for the widow. The New Testament contains specific instructions regarding the care of, of widows. But as we look at these examples of, of visiting orphans and widows in their trouble. True religion, genuine faith, has a social conscience aspect to it. So seeking to do practical good, helping those who are in, in need. And I think it's a wonderful thing that in modern times, uh, uh, Christians so much are at the forefront of, of orphan work. Uh, Mara, who we support as a missionary there in, in an orphanage in Tanzania. 
and likewise advances in, in hospitals and, and education the world over, in large part due to the, to the work of Christians who've gone out and, and, and done good in different parts of the world. And supporting such ministries is great. And I know Mungaraki and Calvary, we're all involved in different, different ways of, of helping those that are in need. But notice there that there's actually a personal side to it. He says, visiting orphans and widows in their trouble. That's, that's personal, isn't it? That's you going to their house, knocking on the door and, and, and providing a listening ear and an encouraging word, praying for them, going and visiting them, seeing what they, seeing what they need. Sometimes it's easy to, 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 it's easy to give. It's hard to give, but sometimes it can be easier to give than actually to, to go and to provide the personal touch which people need. As Christians, we're to do good. We're to be zealous for good works, we read in Titus. We're to be of practical help in church and in society. And James here, he touches upon the, the, the practical help, but really majors on it in chapter 2. Chapter 2 is where he talks all about faith without works is, is dead. And of course, practical help, it comes in many forms, caring for orphans and widows. And chapter 2 speaks of you know, providing clothes and, and food for those who are in need as other examples. I don't think this isn't intended as an exhausted list of, of, of practical help, of good deeds, things that you can do. But they're examples of, of the kind of things that Christians should do for others. But taking us back to where we were at the beginning, you know, personal holiness is vital. How you listen and speak, laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. But here, practical help is no less vital. The two are not in competition, but they go hand in hand. And, and God desires to see both things found in your life. That you would be one who is being sanctified becoming more like jesus and part of becoming more like jesus is that you is that you do good in your life again none of this to 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 be saved to be righteous to be accepted by god but because you already are in christ a living relationship with god must be evidenced by a living faith and that means helping that means serving But personal holiness is again where he closes the the chapter. Verse 27, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. True religion that God is looking for in his saints is one that shows itself in holiness and sanctification. True faith that God is looking for in his children is revealed by a changed life, a putting off of the old life and a putting on of Jesus Christ and all that means. And as the team comes up and as we close our time in song this morning, the Sermon on the Mount uh, is widely regarded as the greatest moral, ethical, and religious teaching ever. Um, The Sermon on the Mount, of course, begins with the Beatitudes. And we've seen how James twice uh, includes Beatitudes of his own in in this opening chapter. A significant portion of the Sermon on the Mount, if you recall, is really to do with not being religious, right? Not praying like the Pharisees did to be seen. Not giving to be seen. Not fasting to be seen. Doing your deeds and doing these things before man rather than doing it privately before before God. The Sermon on the Mount also includes really a lifting of the bar regarding a whole range of issues, uh, murder, um, adultery, divorce, making of oaths, uh, retaliation, what love means and looks like. And so for the religious types who, who are wanting a list of do's and don'ts, Jesus really threw a spanner in the works because he, he raised the bar and he just kept on raising the bar, right? Put 50 kg after 50 kg on, e- on each end of the bar to show you that you can't, you can't do it. You can't keep the law. You can't gain standing with God. Again, where religion says do, God says done. It's only through Jesus, his his sinless, his perfect son, that you can be saved because of what he did for you. Why do I say all that? Well, well, the Sermon on the Mount, it closes with a well-known illustration. 
regarding the wise man and the foolish man and their contrasting foundations, right? And we're all familiar with it. We could all sing the song. The wise man, what did he do? He built his house upon the, the rock. And what happened? The flood and the rain and the wind came and the house fell flat. Then you had the foolish man. He built his house upon the sand. The flood and the rain and the wind came. I said it the wrong way first. Some of you noticed it. <laughs> Good listening. Good hearing. <laughs> the house upon the rock stood firm. There you go. Well done. Gold stars for everyone. The foolish man, his house fell flat. Now we all know the song. And you know the end result of their construction, apparently better than I do. But what was the takeaway of that illustration? What was the point that Jesus was getting about? What was his concluding lesson to this, the greatest teaching ever? Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them is like the wise man. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is like the foolish man. So be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And as we close, if you, you have heard God's word, and I trust the Holy Spirit's drawn perhaps certain areas to your attention this morning, certain things in your life that come to mind when we think about hearing and doing. The question for each of us as we conclude our time and as we go out into the week then is, is what will you do? What will you do about it? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that at times it gives us um, the reality check, the, um, the standstill, the correction that we need. And I hope and pray that we all want to be people who both hear the word and, and do it. And I pray for any this morning, Lord. And I know we're all on this boat to, to one degree or another. But for any for whom there are glaring areas in their lives where they're a hearer, they know what the word says. But like that person who looks at himself in the mirror and forgets what kind of a man, what kind of woman they are, they're not doing it. They're not living it. God, we pray that by your grace, by the empowering of your spirit, you would help us to change. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be. To put off the old to put on the new, to put on the Lord Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen.